So we live now in an era in which people are being accused of crimes, indiscretions, harassment, and even inappropriate social media posts that actually occurred many years ago. The Me Too movement is a reminder that there is no statute of limitations on accountability. Sometimes it takes a seismic social shift to let us know sometimes that what should seem obviously wrong is wrong. But in the social angst of accountability that we are feeling now, the question of forgiveness is being raised. Namely, what does it take for someone to be forgiven? Several months ago, the um, writer and director of the hit Guardians of the Galaxy movies, James Gunn, I don't know if you know about James Gunn, he was fired from the third movie that was in production over tweets from 10 years ago. Now, in his statement, here's what Gunn said. My words of nearly a decade ago were at the time totally failed and unfortunate efforts to be provocative. I have regretted them for many years since, not just because they are stupid, not at all funny, wildly insensitive, and certainly not provocative like I had hoped, but also because they don't reflect the person I am today or have been for some time. Should James Gunn be forgiven for his offensive tweets posted 10 years ago? Should the studio allow him to continue his involvement with the movies? The question surrounding Gunn is relevant for many people. It's not just actors and politicians, but it's about your family and friends. Right? Namely, the question is, how forgiving do we need to be? And what is required to be forgiven? Well, those are the questions so relevant today. When it comes to forgiveness, it's important to know that in the Jewish tradition, forgiveness is not granted as much as it is earned. We live in a time in which people blame the wrongful acts they've committed on physical, emotional, or medical conditions without accepting any of their actions. They enroll in rehabilitation programs as a means of cleansing away their sin sins. The inability to acknowledge fault and accept blame is nothing new. It's from the beginning of time. You know the story of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve who eat of the tree. You know it's Eve who blames the serpent and Adam who blames Eve. There's no accountability. You see, the Garden of Eden is a place of perfection. And we humans are imperfect. So we don't belong in that Garden of Eden. Because Midrash acknowledges tradition, misdeeds are part of the human condition. And because they're part of a human condition, we need a path to repentance, what we call tshuva. By the way, in some cases, there are real medical, psychological issues that motivate people's behavior. I've had a number of congregants, trust me, sit in my office, dealing with addiction to alcohol, to drugs, and who are struggling. They want to change their lives. I've lived through the chaos created when people go off their medication for mental health issues. But even with these important issues that deal with health and mind and body, any, any system that talks about repentance includes the repentant process. To change means you have to own up to what you have done. But very often, people are not prepared to do that. In order to understand the concept of forgiveness, we need to distinguish it from repentance. Repentance, forgiveness. Two different paths that we're going to talk about. When I use the name, the word repentance, by the way, how many of you think about it? Raise your hand. How many of you put this in a religious context? Right? Like, this is what you do. When you have sin, you repent. Right? Raise your hand. All right? I, I looked for a synonym for repentance, and I, I couldn't find one that I thought was better. I found regret, remorse, penitence, contrition, shame, penance. 
The problem is that they don't describe those words. They don't describe the process of owning up to what you've done, feeling the remorse about what you've done, and trying to make it different. Now, why not? Maybe because we live in a secular world in which you can't imagine that you need a process to change. We need to be able to think in that context of what it means to have repentance. And so when I use that language today, it's going to be in a non-religious context, simply in terms of what it means in our own lives. So let me begin with my understanding of the difference between repentance and forgiveness. Repentance is the process that the wrongdoer must go through. It's a journey on which we, when we've done it wrong, embark upon that begins with acknowledging that the act is wrong, an apology to the person we've wronged, and finally working to undo the harm that we have created. Trying to be a better person. That is the process of repentance. Forgiveness is on the other side. It's the process we go through on our journey to be healed when something is committed against us, when we have been wronged. As a victim of some act committed against us, we actually have some control. Namely, can we forgive that person? Isn't that the control you want to hold on to so often? There are many people who suggest that forgiveness is an act of, forgiving, of giving up anger, resentment, and a need for revenge. And there are people who will use that term to just, right, let go of something that took place to them. Christianity posits this idea that you can have forgiveness without an apology. I personally reject that idea. But I want to give you another term, and that's what I call letting go. You see, when someone has wronged you, you can let go. You can choose because it doesn't matter what they've done. You take the control away from them. By letting go, you no longer are shackled to the wrong that was committed against you. But that, that is not forgiveness. It's just letting go. Forgiveness cannot be granted without an apology from the wrongdoer. Can the unrepentant murderer be forgiven by the family of the person he's murdered? Can the rapist be granted forgiveness by the woman he violated without acknowledging the pain and trauma that he caused her? I want to argue against using that term forgiveness in this context. Because forgiveness really is, I want to talk today, about a process of reconciliation between two people, or more, who are engaged in a conflict. That's what repentance and forgiveness is about. They are interconnected. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Each path has a life of its own. Sometimes they're achieved, but other times they're not. What is clear is that the penitence process of repentance does influence the ability to achieve forgiveness from the person that's been wronged. So what is repentance? A major part of repentance, I think we'd all agree, wouldn't you say it has to be sincere? Don't you want, when somebody apologizes and to know, don't you want it to be sincere and that you know that they feel it? But how do you know that they really feel it? You can't, can you sometimes? Because it's an outward symptom of, a, of an internal feeling. And we don't have the ability to see inside them. Apologies are at the heart of repentance. We've seen some doozies of public apologies in the last year, haven't we? Was Kevin Spacey's apology sincere? What about Roseanne Barr? Matt Lauer? Bill O'Reilly? Now, by the way, in our politically charged culture, I want you to know that I chose people from the right and from the left of the political spectrum. <laughs> you were listening. Because if I hadn't, I know that you would have required repentance of me. <laughs> I know you well. But are those apologies, and were they sincere? How do we acknowledge when and know when an apology is acceptable? So in Judaism, we have this alliteration of the five R's of tshuva, of repentance. The first one is recognize. You have to recognize that you did something wrong. Two, you have to have remorse. Own up to what you did and feel the sense of remorse inside. 
Three, repentance, which means demonstrate repentance by an apology. Restitution, number four, which means to provide compensation if you wrong somebody. And five, resolve never to do it again. So true repentance requires sincerity. The wrongdoer must acknowledge what they did wrong. It's not so easy, though, to do that, is it, sometimes? To acknowledge what you did wrong means to own up to it. It means you have to deal with the consequences. It's much easier to deny it and ignore it because then you don't have to deal with the consequences. I want to tell you that that first stage, owning up and recognize you did something wrong, takes a great act of courage sometimes. To look inside, to admit when you have done wrong. Being able to own up to the possibility that we did wrong requires that introspection, the willingness to look inside. How can we tell if the person is truly remorseful? How can we truly know if they're sincere? Usually it's by the nature of their apology. So some of you give apologies like this. Listen carefully. I'm sorry if you felt hurt when I did that. How far did that one get you? Does it work? That's the apology when we don't want to own up to what we've done. But how about this one? What I did was wrong, and I feel awful that it caused you pain. That's owning up. And in that apology, we know where people are. The press relief from an actor that acknowledges that he, quote, is taking the time necessary to seek evaluation and treatment, and no other information is available at this time, is not an apology. A statement that quotes, I'm entering a program and therefore request privacy, <laughs> is not an apology. The first three R's of recognize remorse and repentance, the apology, are essential to forgiveness. But people, many often, very often, believe that this is the end of the process of repentance and not the beginning. They feel the apology is what you get to and that you're done. The words came out, I believe, come on, I'm sorry, believe me. But it's not always that case and you know that. See, the first three R's are supposed to get you there. But it's the last two R's that are true the repentant path. And what does it mean to then give restitution? Well, if you stole something from somebody, it's obvious you have to pay them back. If you hit their car and didn't tell them, you've got to own up and make those repairs. But I want to suggest, though, that restitution is not just financial, because restitution has to do with repairing and undoing what you did. So by the way, if you created conflict between two people, you should be trying to repair that act. If you did something wrong to harm someone's reputation, you need to figure out how to make that right. It's not enough to apologize to that person. And even when you feel it, those words are just words. Repentance is part of an action. And that's why when we get to the end of the story, we'll understand what it means to in today's world. See, the fifth R, resolving not to do it again, that's something many people say but don't live up to it. They promise to be patient next time, but they can't change. Resolving not to do something again must be backed up with action. If you've cheated, if you've lied, you have to show that you have changed. Not just said you would. Maimonides, by the way, the great medieval philosopher, says that true repentance is not achieved until, by the way, you're in the same situation where you did the wrong, and this time, you do it right. That's the liberation of true repentance. And that's when people know that you have changed. See, Forgiveness is different. Forgiveness, if a person follows the steps of repentance, 
Do we have to forgive that person? Some of you might know that the rabbis mandated this process of asking people three times. If you go to them, and by the way, it's very clear to the rabbis, you just don't go on your own. By the way, you have to take three people with you to witness that you asked that person for forgiveness. So you go the first time, and they say, no, not ready, sorry. You go back a second time and a third time, with a sincere apology. According to rabbinic tradition, you are forgiven. By the way, some traditions even say that it's on the person you've wronged in not giving you forgiveness that they have now sinned. By the way, um, Maimonides, just to set this straight, Maimonides says that if you've wronged your rabbi, <laughs> this is true, um, you have to apologize forever. <laughs> Three times is not enough, I swear. This idea of uh, apologizing three times, I've studied it many times as a rabbi, and I always thought it was about getting the wrongdoer to get to that place where they really acknowledge it, where they are sincere finally, each time more and more sincere, and they see the pain that you've caused. But I've come to understand perhaps a different understanding. I want to suggest that this process is in part to allow the person who's been wronged time to be able to forgive. Don't you need time to really grant forgiveness? Not just letting go, but truly to forgive somebody. And maybe during those times in which you've rejected the person, maybe you see that you can, that they have changed. Maybe you see that they are new. I love this idea that the rabbis are allowing us time to go through the process of forgiveness. Sincere forgiveness requires time, just as sincere repentance does. By the way, sometimes forgiveness just isn't possible. And I know that. I've had people in my office so badly hurt that they just can't give that forgiveness. Sometimes it's the abuse suffered at the hands of a parent. Sometimes it's the dishonesty of a spouse. The closer that relationship the greater the hurt, the greater the hurt, the harder forgive. More than letting the wrongdoer off the hook, forgiveness sets us free when we can give it. We acknowledge by the way that the world can't go back to the way it was. That's not what forgiveness is about. It's not about reversing time and going back. We continue on forward. The energy that the, we once used to hold that resentment and anger can be applied and now in a positive direction. Do you all agree that you have a finite amount of energy to expend on any given day, in any given life? Do you agree? So imagine freeing up that negative energy and being able to apply it in a positive direction of your life. How liberating is that? Therefore, the question really is, how long do you want to hold that person accountable? Isn't that what it's often about? How long do you want to punish them? In truth, I'm going to tell you, there's no objective timetable. It's a complex formula, far beyond my understanding. But it has something to do with the severity of the wrong committed, the severity and the sincerity of the repentant person, and the ability of that person who is wrong to be able to forgive. It's a very complex formula, greater than any IT algorithm that one could imagine. What is clear is that an apology followed by a stint in rehab should not be considered to be a formula for immediate forgiveness. The penitent and the person wrong must both travel their own journey, and sometimes these paths don't intersect when you think that they should. Sometimes a penitent deserves to be forgiven. But sometimes that pain is just too great. The closer the relationship, the greater the violation, and the greater the pain. The people closest to you will hurt you the most. The people that you should forgive that are closest to you 
will be the hardest to forgive. I've seen, I've seen those people locked, locked in the ability and inability to give forgiveness. Forgiveness is not automatic. It doesn't come in an instant. And not just because you've realized that you've done wrong. Forgiveness in a relationship means that you can reset it with new possibilities for growth. It can never be the same. But with honesty and rebuilding, the relationship can become strong again. Never the same. We can't undo the harm we've caused. But it can be different. Different is what we have to accept. Today, in a world of text messaging, Amazon, same-day delivery, instant everything, people want instant forgiveness. Isn't that true? Just issue a statement of a changed life. That's often the price of forgiveness, isn't it? That we, say these, we see the hurt that they caused us has actually created change in them. That's when we're likely to give forgiveness. What about our society? Have we become too harsh in our punishment, in our judgment, too unforgiving of people being able to change, too punitive to allow for repentance? There's a rabbinic, rabbinic midrash that says that when God first tried to create the world, he tried to create it with only judgment. And God saw that he couldn't create a world just with judgment. So God tried to create a world with just compassion and saw that it couldn't create, couldn't exist with just compassion either. So God created a world with both qualities, judgment and compassion, but made compassion stronger. We have to believe that people can change. That's what these 10 days of repentance are about. That's what the hope of humanity is, that people can change. Rabbi Charles Klein explains in his book on forgiveness, quote, we forgive not because we believe that what was done was unimportant, but because we are prepared to put aside our anger long enough to hear words which reflect remorse, long enough to begin to believe that people have the potential to grow. Another rabbinic midrash says that before God said enough to walk the repentant life, we must hold people accountable, and yet we must allow a place a place where repentance is possible. By giving forgiveness when it's deserved, we demonstrate the very hope of the world that we want. We make the world a better place. Is there somebody that you need to ask forgiveness of? I want you to think about that. Do you have the humility, the courage to ask for that forgiveness? the work necessary to achieve? Are you ready to live the repentant life? Initiating the process of forgiveness requires us to overcome that fear. Is there somebody that you need to forgive? That you see that they've changed and they deserve another chance? And to repair that relationship means to repair the world in some way. See, these are the questions, the big questions you confront today. The book of life is open. Your symbolic life of your deeds and misdeeds, they tell your story. But how you handle your misdeeds define your character. You can't just throw them behind you. You have to deal with it to the of your journey. Do you need to begin a path of repentance for something you did? Do you need to work on forgiveness of someone else? May you all, may you all have the courage to embark upon the necessary path. May this be a year of repentance and forgiveness for us all. And let us say, Amen. Amen.